Good morning, everyone. Today is Tuesday, April 14th. It is a nice, sunny day, unlike yesterday. Um, I don't know if any of you lost power yesterday, um, but the winds and the rain was crazy. Um, yeah, I was worried that I was going to lose power. I thankfully didn't. But um, my electric company did call me to, like, tell me that I might lose power and to charge my phone and my computer and anything I would need um, because the power could have been out for, like, a couple hours. So um, that was nice that they gave us the heads up because we did you know, charge everything that we needed just in case, but we got lucky and we didn't lose power. Um, but I'm so happy that I woke up this morning and it's a nice sunny day. Um, I think it's supposed to be like in the 50s today, which is pretty much the warmest that we've gotten so far. So um, I'll probably try to go outside and take a walk again today. Um, I hope that some of you have been getting outside and getting some fresh air or at least like opening the window in your bedroom if you have one. Um, yeah. I miss you guys a lot. Um, like I said yesterday, this week feels really weird. Um, I mean, every week has felt weird, but I think because we're finally at that like month point, it's like, whoa. Um, yeah, just feels really weird. So, missing you guys extra this week. Um, I hope you took advantage of yesterday's makeup day by making up any work that you needed to. Um, I saw a ton of submitted work <clears throat> via Google Classroom and on my email um, yesterday and last night. So, it looks like a lot of you did take advantage of that, so thank you for doing that. Um, and I also got questions about homework, so those of you that were all caught up, it looks like you guys were able to spend yesterday focused on homework, so that's awesome too. So thank you all for your hard work. Um, today we are back to normal. We're, we're going to be finishing the book this week, which I'm so excited about. Perfect time. Um, to finish it right before April break. Um, so today we're going to be reading chapter 11 um, and we're just back to normal today. So back to normal means that you need your notebook for your focus word and your teacher notes. You need a pencil or something to write with. And you will eventually need your Dragon Wings book if you have it. If you don't have it, then you can use the readings that I post on Google, Google Classroom. Awesome. So um, my printer is not working, and my husband hasn't been at work since last Wednesday. Um, so I was not able to print... Um, the do now and the teacher notes myself and he was not able to print them at work um, So he is going to work today. So I'll have him print the rest of the week um, But for today, we're gonna try our best to do it using uh, My phone, so I apologize if there's a little bit of a glare. I recommend that um, You just pause the video and try your best, okay? So today's do now is disheartened. And disheartened means to cause a person to lose hope, enthusiasm, or courage. So that picture is a great example of what feeling disheartened looks like. The example sentence we're going to be reading is disheartened but not without hope. Moonshadow and Windrider go to the top of the hill and look out over Oakland and San Francisco. So something's gonna happen to Moonshadow and Windrider in this chapter that makes them feel disheartened to the point where all they have to do is sit at the top of the hill and look out over the city. 
go ahead and pause this to finish. I'm going to move on to the notes. So, um, one thing that I've noticed on your work, like for example, last week when we were doing the central idea worksheets is that a lot of you are confusing some of the um, reading strategies. Um, and that's okay. You guys aren't physically in person with Ms. Cromartie and I. I understand that some of your work is not going to be perfect. Um, but a lot of you, instead of doing central idea, you were making predictions or you were summarizing. And um, I made comments letting you know that that is what you did and that, you know, that's okay. But in the future, make sure you read the directions fully. And um, I clarified what central idea is. Um, but I wanted to make sure that you knew that making predictions and summarizing are very valuable reading strategies as well. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So our teacher notes are about making predictions. So these are your teacher notes. And this is review. So we already know that a prediction is a statement about will, what will or might happen in the future of the book. And we should always be making predictions. So for those of you who last week on the central idea assignment were making predictions, you weren't necessarily wrong for doing that. That's a great reading strategy that you're constantly thinking about making predictions. That's just not what that specific worksheet asked for. And if you're like, I did the worksheet right, what is Miss Mari talking about? How do I make a prediction? Well, how to make a prediction, you ask yourself questions while reading, like, hmm, I wonder why that happened. Or why would that character say that? Or why would Moonshadow do that? And then you use what you know about that chapter or about the whole story to guess where the story is going. So you could take an educated guess to try to figure out why Moonshadow did what he did or why Uncle Brightstar said what he said. Go ahead and pause this if you're not finished. Awesome. So <clears throat> this is just a quick picture that I'm going to show you. We've showed you this picture many times this year. This is just an example of making predictions. So when you see a boy with a dog and a ball, and then you see the boy throw the ball, you can predict that the dog is going to chase the ball and catch it. And the reason you can predict that is because you maybe have background knowledge of the game of fetch, You've maybe been to the park before and have seen this happen between another boy and another dog. You might have a dog yourself who enjoys playing fetch. So you would use background knowledge that you have to figure that out. It's a really simple way of thinking about it. Awesome. So. Um, today's worksheet is going to be about summarizing specifically, and tomorrow we'll do a little bit more with predicting. But like I said, some of you were doing awesome summaries on the worksheets last week. That's just not what the directions asked for. So um, I wanted to encourage that um, today. So um, because summarizing is a great reading strategy, and it seems like a lot of you have a great grasp on that. So, um, before we read today, if you want to go ahead and open the document that says Chapter 11 Summary that's attached to this assignment on Google Classroom, I just want to quickly show you what's on there before we start reading because I know some of you have been reading independently and then, um, 
you've been getting confused on the directions of the worksheet because I usually read and then give the directions of the worksheet. So I'm going to try it this way this week so that those of you who like to read independently can read independently. So on this worksheet, um, at the top you'll see a reference sheet. So this reference sheet is just to remind you how to summarize. You've been summarizing since like third grade, so this should be second nature to you at this point. But just in case you forget, you obviously read the text, number one. Number two, don't worry about those big words. We are nearing the end of sixth grade, so the texts that we are reading are challenging. Um, some of the texts that we're reading, seventh graders might even read. So there are going to be words that you don't know, for sure. There are words that I don't know in Dragon Wings. There are words that I don't know in other texts that we read. When you read, you're not expected to know every word. You're expected to know enough words that you can comprehend the text. So if you're constantly, you know, saying to yourself, I don't know this word and this word and this word and this word and this word, and you haven't even gotten through like a paragraph or a page, then yeah, you're going to run into an issue with your comprehension. But if there is just one strange word, like especially someone's name or the, the name of a town or something, don't let it scare you. One trick that I um, like to use is if I see um, a name that I can't pronounce or I don't understand, then I'll replace it with a name that I do. So instead of saying Oakland, I might say Boston. Or instead of saying um, Uncle Brightstar, I might say Uncle Tom. So that doesn't change the understanding of the story. That just changes the difficult word. Number three, ask what was this text about? So you could read a paragraph and do it paragraph by paragraph and say, okay, what was this paragraph about? And you can make a little note on a piece of paper or in the margin of the text um, just to keep yourself in check. Make sure that you're not zoning out while you're reading. Um, when you summarize, your answer should be at least one complete paragraph, which was what most of you were doing last week. It should cover the main point and key ideas, again, what most of you were doing last week, and it should be in your own words. Some of you were doing this, some of you weren't. Summaries don't have any cited evidence in them. Summaries are straight up your words, your interpretation of the text. Awesome. So underneath that part, you'll see where it says name and date. So obviously, you're going to put your name and today's date there. And then it simply says write your summary below. And you're just going to write a paragraph in your own words of what Chapter 11 was about. A paragraph is at least five sentences in this situation. So I'm actually going to add that to the worksheet. Awesome. And then if you keep scrolling down, um, there's just like one more helpful reference sheet that I'm actually going to move closer to the top. Um, sorry, guys. And it just says, do you need this information to understand the text? If the answer is yes, then you need to put it in your summary. Simple as that. If you read a piece of information that you're not sure whether it's important or not, you ask yourself that question, and that's your answer. If you don't need to know that they ate dumplings for lunch to know that the earthquake ruined the town, then don't tell me that they ate dumplings for lunch. I do not need that minor detail. All right? Awesome. So that being said, I am now going to um, start reading chapter 11. So if you've been reading independently, um, you can go ahead and start reading independently at this point and then this, do this worksheet since I already walked you all through it. Um, if you prefer to listen to me read, that's fine too. 
I'm gonna go ahead and get started right now. Awesome. So, chapter 11. is on page 257, 257. And because we are writing a summary of the whole chapter, we do need to read the whole chapter. So um, like I've told you in past videos, if you don't have the time to listen to the whole thing right now, you might wanna pause this video and come back to it later. Um, or you could, you know, listen to part of the chapter now and come back later if you have to. Um, but it is a pretty long chapter, so bear with me. I'm going to take a sip of my drink. Oh, that's a new coffee that I got. I don't like it. <laughs> Ugh. All right. So, chapter 11, Exile. May 1906 to September 1909. A demon week later, Father and I moved across the bay to a place in the foothills above Oakland. We used Miss Whitlaw's wagon, taking it across on the ferry. Later, Father would return it to the Tang Man in San Francisco, who had agreed to buy it. The wagon rattled up a dirt path to a plateau halfway up a hillside. The winds roared so loudly about us that Father had to shout to me. Feel those winds, Moonshadow? Father asked. Aren't they beautiful? They'll help us when we try to launch the flying machine. I tried my best to hold on to my hat. Are they like this in the winter time? I guess so, Father said. In fact, I hope so. We'll be testing our models every clear day. I said nothing because I did not want to spoil Father's enthusiasm. Page 258. As the wagon rolled on, Father went on making plans. In his own mind, he was already flying. Father took the path that led away from the roadway. Eventually, we came to an old iron fence covered with a tangle of weeds and shrubs. I suppose at one time there had been a gate over the path, but someone had taken it away. Father told me that we were living on what had once been a rich estate belonging to the Esperanza family. At first, we were surrounded by former or orchids of apple, cherry, and apricot trees that had now become wild. I found out later that their fruit was too small and bitter and full of worms to be eaten. But right then, the trees filled the air with a sweet, promising scent of blossoms. Past the orchids in the middle of the estate was a garden that must have covered nearly ten acres. It seemed as if the garden held every type of flower, bush, herb, and tree in the demon land. But because no gardener watched them, they now grew helter-skelter in a riot of color and greenery. Finally, Father stopped the wagon before two large ramshackle buildings. I looked at the larger one, which seemed to have once been a mansion constructed in the demon style. Are we going to live in that? I asked doubtfully. Page 259. In that old ruin? Father laughed and pointed out the places on the sides where some scavengers had already taken the boards away. The panes of glass in the windows had been either broken or stolen, and the roof had begun to cave in. Father nodded at the other building, a large one of plain, straight design. It was about two stories high, but there were only a few windows at the level of the first story. No, sir, we're living in the barn. When we first walked into the barn, the smell nearly knocked me down. Father set down his box of ammonia and disinfectants. I had wondered why he had spent so much money on them, but now I knew. The barn was awfully drafty, too, but I guess I ought to be grateful that it was. We scrubbed and soaked and tried almost everything to get rid of the smell of horses and manure, but even after a day's work, we did not quite manage it. Disappointed, Father said, maybe this will help. He went over the left wall of the barn where the stable hand had once slept in a little walled-off section. There was a pot-bellied stove there and a pipe leading from it to the wall to let out the smoke. There was already a shelf on part of the wall. Father put Uncle's cup of soil there and slipped a dozen inc incense sticks into it and lit them. Little plumes of smoke, thick as worms, began to riff in the air. There he said, stepping back, if we can't chase out the smell, maybe we can cover it up. Page 260. Yes, sir. I rolled my sleeves back down after washing my arms and hands. Somehow I knew that the incense would never quite get the smell out. 
I set a board over two empty boxes and then rummaged around in our things until I found the paper ink and ink well. Then I got some water from the pump outside. What are you doing? Father asked. I'm getting things ready for a letter to Mother. We haven't written her yet telling her about our changing plans. The last thing she's heard is that we were in the Tang People's Town helping the company rebuild the store. I thought if we wrote a letter this afternoon, you could mail it when you went back to return the wagon. Father sat down reluctantly on the dirt floor before the board. I can just hear the school teacher now telling everyone in the village. It's Mother who has to listen to them laughing, I pointed out. I wish I could spare her that. Father chewed the end of the brush's wooden handle. We have the easy part. All we have to do is fly. She has to live in the village. Saying that, he began to write. Page 261. Father worked as a handyman or an all-around mechanic when he could, but he would cut firewood or do almost anything so long as it was legal and it paid. I managed to get a job as a delivery boy for a grocer, but it meant I did not talk much with Father. By the time I got home, cooked dinner, and did my lessons and my chores, I would be so tired that I would go right to bed. Eventually, I wound up running our household, or maybe our barn hold is a better word. Among other things, I planned our meals, washed our clothes, kept the barn as clean as I could under the circumstances, and oversaw the budget once Father showed me how to do it. That left Father all his free time to work on flying. Somehow we managed to send some money home, too. Once a month on a Sunday, I walked down into Oakland and rode the trolley to the ferry depot where I would join a lot of other Tang men, houseboys and other day workers. From there, we would ride the ferry boat over to San Francisco. Father never went because he did not want to waste any of his free time. Once I was in the Tang people's town, I would deposit our money with the district association and pick up letters. Sometimes there were notes from hand clapper White Deer, who would convey Lefty's regards since Lefty himself could no longer write. Page 262. Then I would finish shopping and start the long trip back home, arriving late in the evening, usually to find Father bent over the table, working feverishly at the plans, or finishing some model he was going to test. I don't know whether the smell of the barn got less or our noses grew used to it, but after a while we stopped noticing it. Spring turned into summer and the grass in the garden changed into a ruddy gold color. When you walked through the orchids, the air was thick with the sickly sweet smell of fruit rotting in the ground. It was not until early August that we received a reply from mother and grandmother concerning father's revelations. It was a thick envelope, so I had expected several pages mostly from grandmother scolding us. But when father opened it, there was only one single sheet and a second smaller envelope. He spread the sheet out quickly on the table and began to read out loud. I sat across from him, fiddling with my own writing brush while I listened. As we expected, Grandmother called Father a fool, who was a disgrace to the family, both the living and the dead, and so on. I was surprised the schoolmaster's brush had not burned up, but she again warned us to watch out for the water in our new demon home, so I suppose she had not totally turned her back on us. Page 263. As also could be expected, Mother was patient and understanding, saying what a truly wonderful thing it was to meet the Dragon King. Father picked up the second, smaller envelope and slid it over the table to me. It's for you, he said, puzzled. I reached over and turned up the light from the kerosene lamp. Sure enough, my name was on it. It was the first time I had ever had a letter addressed only to me. Father drummed his fingers on the table. Well, aren't you going to open it? Yes, of course. I hastily tore open the envelope and slipped out the thin rice paper sheet. I read the letter silently. It is very hard to say these things by the hand of another. I long to hold you, but the only comfort I can offer are these words, which I myself cannot write. But though the words are written by another, they are my words nonetheless. Above everything else, you must not show this letter to your father, for I must tell you some things about him. First of all, I knew he was an unusual man when I married him, but I had no idea he had once been the physician to the Dragon King himself. Page 264. I do not care what the others say. I am bursting with pride right now. But this brings me to the second thing. I wish more than ever that I could be with you right now, for your father has undertaken no small task. But since I cannot be there, you must love him doubly hard. You must give him not only your support, but also try to give him mine as well. It is a great deal to ask of you, but I know you will be able to do it. I have not seen you now for four difficult, impossible years, and yet from your letters, I feel that you are still the child I love, and that you will soon be a man that I can be proud of.
At the bottom of the letter was mother's name. I read through the letter several times, feeling suddenly very sad and tired. I had not really thought about my mother in a long time. Well, father demanded impatiently, what does your mother say? I suppose it must be your mother. Your grandmother would never waste money on a second letter. Page 265. I folded the letter and put it carefully back into its envelope. I think she understands, sir, about not telling her your dream and about the delay in bringing her over. Father pointed at the envelope still in my hands. Does she say it in there? He looked as if he were eager to read it. No, sir, but that's what she means. How do you know? We used to figure out what to put in each of our letters to you. I know what she'd say and what she wouldn't. Father massaged his forehead. How long has it been since I've seen her? He asked himself. I think almost 12 years. Why do I want to bother with flying anyway? White Deer says that you can only follow the course of your own nature. I got up and poured a cup of tea for father and set it down in front of him. I wished mother were there. She would have known the right things to say. But as it was, I had to try to stumble through in my own clumsy way. And who knows, maybe one of these days we'll fly back across the sea and pick her up. Father laughed and seemed to relax. I'm afraid that handclap's more likely to build that kind of machine than me. Page 266. I'll be happy if I can just stay in the air for a few minutes. But you could tell he felt better. He gulped down the tea. Well, we'd better be getting back to work. Then it was fall and the rains came. The trees of the orchard began to lose their leaves and look like sheep huddling against the fence. And new grass and flowers began to shove their way up through the now old and dried out growths in the garden. When I could, I would spend a lot of time outside, sitting on an old crate by the side of the barn, watching the fog drifting close through the trees, snagging out the branches or crawling cat-like through the garden. It was about the same temperature whether I was inside or outside the barn. We had done our best to repair the holes in the roof, but there was still one or two little leaks that dribbled all the time. We had no spare money to replace the broken panes of glass in the windows, but we did the next best thing by taping some heavy paper over the holes and oiling the paper so it became translucent. It helped cut the wind down some, but still let in the light. We also tried to cover up the spaces between the boards with mud and straw, but even so, the wind would get through into the barn. Page 267. And the place was so huge that we could never quite warm it up. By now, Father had hung huge models of the flying machines, some up to six feet in wingspan, from the rafters, and these would twist and turn as if they were giant captive moths. But winter was my favorite time to be outside, on those special days when the rains had stopped and the fog had burned away. The air had been washed clear of any soot or dust or smoke, and the whole world seemed fresh and crystal sharp. I could look out then and see the city of Oakland line stretched out at the foot of our hill, all the houses looking like toy blocks. And beyond Oakland was the bay, smooth as a pane of green glass. On any sunny day, you could see sailboats gliding over the surface, leaving fine white lines behind them that were their wakes. Their sails would belly out full and white before the wind, and the breeze would rise up from the bay, cool and salty, passing over the hissing grass. And beyond the bay was the city, the only city as far as I was concerned. In the next three years, I watched as much of what is restored. The ships would lie at anchor by the wharves like lazy water buds. You could see the streets tilting skyward and the houses scattered over them like very colored beads, and the brightest cluster of beads was the Tang People's Town. Page 268. It was as if the earthquake had only been a bad dream. But if the view in the daylight was good, the view by moonlight was even better. Then all the lights in the houses burned. Below our hill, the lights of Oakland would gleam like a cloud of fireflies, and the wrinkling waters of the bay would turn to quick civil, silver under the moon. And beyond the bay, beyond even the ships with the lights hung on their sides, would be the lights of San Francisco. Thousands and thousands of kerosene or gas lamps glittering like the gold scales of a serpent. It was like a river of light, and each light represented a person or maybe several people. The lights of their homes or the street lights outside them, and I did not think of them as scrabbling for money or being stupid or malicious. It was as if they had each become a tiny star shining in the darkness. I had found my mountain of gold after all, and it had not been nuggets, but people who had made it up. People like the company and the Whitlaws. I had not realized until I had left it that I had been on the mountain of gold all that time, and somehow, being on our hillside, I felt above it all now somehow freer and purer, working toward the fulfillment of Father's dream, page 269. Somehow, all the worries and fears of the past seem small and petty now.
Those next three years were hard years. I was cold sometimes. I was hungry other times. I was tired most of the time, but I could not say I was really unhappy, only uncomfortable. All about me, I had father's dream taking visible form, first in the pictures and the articles he had taped to the walls, then in the models and the diagrams he began to hang up, and finally in the skeleton of the flying machine itself, which he began to construct with light wooden poles. And on three Sundays out of the month, there were trips to the Whitlaws. At first, I had felt sorry for Miss Whitlaw, but I should have realized there was nothing that could faze that lady. She had her stained glass window carefully wrapped in cloth and brown paper inside a box that father had built for her, and she always had her stereopticon and slides and some of her books. Some Sundays, though, they would come to visit us and help fly father's huge model gliders. They were as thrilled at father's progress as we were, and when we began to actually build the aeroplane, they made a point of coming down with an already fixed cold supper and helping us. But though they called it the aeroplane, or sometimes the flying machine, father and I always thought of it as dragon wings. Page 270. It took three years to build dragon wings because we never seemed to have much money to go around. We were still sending money home to my mother, and because we had to learn by trial and error how to build the frame and stretch the canvas over it. But by the end of the summer of the demon year 1909, we were ready. Father once tried to explain to me just how the aeroplane was supposed to work, but I never did follow much of it, though I do remember the shape. The aeroplane had no solid body. It was only an empty frame about 20 feet long, 4 feet high in front, and angling up and back to only about a foot. The canvas-covered wings, which were 40 feet long and 6 and a half feet wide, were on top of the frame's center. Six-foot-long struts separated the top wing from the bottom one. There was no cockpit as there is in modern flying machines. The pilot lay flat on his stomach on the bottom wing. To his right, also on the wing, was an engine which powered the two propellers by a gear and sprocket system like the one in a bicycle. The propellers faced to the rear, pushing the aeroplane forward rather than pulling it. Page 271. In front of the flying machine was a pair of smaller wings, about four feet long and about foot part, which the Wrights called horizontal rudders. Future aeronauts would call these little wings elevators because they forced the aeroplane up and down in the air. The little wings could be tilted upward or downward. When they were aimed upward, they sent the wind at an angle around and through the rest of the aeroplane so the machine would go up. When the front edges were aimed toward the ground, the machine was directed downward. Father handled these with the control held in his right hand. In the rear of the frame was another set of wings, also about four feet long and a foot apart, but these rose vertically rather than horizontally. The vertical rudders allowed the aeroplane to make a level turn to the left or to the right, but an aeroplane can also turn in another way once it is in the air, and that way is also called banking. As the Wrights wrote father, banking had always been a problem for earlier aeronauts who had tried to do that simply by shifting their weight around inside the aeroplane. The Wrights had solved the problem by controlling the shape of the wings. Orville told father to think of a box from which both ends had been cut and which father was holding in his hands, his left hand holding the top forward corner and rear lower corner of one end and his right hand holding the top rear corner and the forward lower corner. Page 272. If father moved his left hand downward and moved his right hand upward, the top and bottom of the box would twist or warp. The front left edges of the top and bottom of the box would curl downward, while the front right edges of the top and bottom would curve upward. If this happened to the two wings of the aeroplane, the two sides of the aeroplane's wings would be presented at different angles to the wind. As a result, the left sides of the wings would rise and the right sides would dip flying faster than the right side so that the aeroplane would bank to the right. That is, the aeroplane would seem to pivot on the right side of its wings and turn to the right. The wings could be warped in the opposite way, of course, so that the aeroplane would bank to the left. Father built controls for the vertical rudders and the warping mechanism of the wing following the design of the rights. Since there was neither seat nor seat belts, Father had to hold on to the flying machine with his left hand. The only way father could control both the rear rudders and the curving of the wings was with a kind of hip cradle. By moving his hips left or right inside the wooden cradle, he could make the machine turn either left or right. But of course, he could not make a level turn to the left or right that was separate from banking to the left or the right, as you can in a modern flying machine. Page 273. Father's own improvement on the Wright's original design was to put four wheels on the bottom of the frame center. If the flying machine and the control system sound funny, you have to keep in mind that these machines were among the first ever built. 
It was hard to believe when you saw a picture of the Wright's flying machine that it really could fly. It was mostly a skeleton of wooden poles, with canvas stretched only over the wings. It seemed like a rather flimsy thing to trust your life to, as it was not much better than a big kite. Our motor was only about 12 horsepower, which we thought very powerful, for in 1903 the Wrights had hunted both in this land and in the other demon lands over the seas for a lightweight engine producing some 12 horsepower, and they had been unable to find one. They had to build their own. Fortunately, engines of the kind we needed were now available, but they were expensive. We had to dip heavily into our savings, and of course the propellers had to be carved exactly according to the Wrights' tables. That was a headache, believe me. Page 274. Somehow we did it. Neither the coughs nor the troubles we met building dragon wings could stop us. Finally, there came the day near the end of August when Father announced that we were ready. It was a good thing we finished it when we did, because we were just about broke. We had tried to pay our rent, food, expenses, and money for Mother out of our earnings, but little by little we had to dip into our savings until we had only enough to pay the rent for next month and hire a team of horses and a wagon to haul dragon wings up to the top of our hill and fly it. Even though dragon wings did have wheels, we needed to carry it in a wagon because its wheels would have sunk into the ruts in the road and its wings, brushing the ground, might have gotten torn or even broken. If that test flight worked, we'd borrow money somehow and do it a second time before an audience of paying spectators. And with the money from that, we'd pay our rent for the next month and hire another team of horses and fly at some county fair near here and so on. To be honest, it did not sound like much of a plan to me. Father was more of a mechanical artist than a businessman. He wanted so badly to fly that it never occurred to him that people might not pay to see him fly. Sometimes people want a thing so much that they lose their common sense. Page 275. But if Father had been practical, he probably would not have been trying to fly in the first place. I shot out all those worries, like what would happen if we tested dragon wings and it did not fly, or how to drum up an audience if dragon wings did test out. It was around the end of that same August of 1909 that I began to get jumpy, like I was being watched sometimes from the trees, sometimes from the vacant mansion. At first, I told myself it was just nerves. After all, I was getting positively ancient, for I was now 15 or 14 by demon reckoning. It was not so much my age that bothered me. It was the fact that after six years here in the land of the Golden Mountain, I had even less chance of seeing Mother. I was proud of Father for wanting to be a dragon again, and even prouder of the fact that he was now so close to achieving his ambition to fly. I was just sorry that we had not been able to combine his more lofty goals with the more ordinary dream of seeing Mother. Of course, Father thought he could, but even so, his scheme had an awful lot of ifs in it. But Mother was patient, so I had to be too. And the feeling that there was someone or something else around kept on growing inside me. Sometimes at night, when I came back to the barn, I would find a chair where I was sure it had not been, or books misshelved, page 276. But with no real definite proof, I held my peace. On the first Sunday in September, we had the Whitlaws down to help us christen dragon wings. The night before, Father and I had spent all our time painting scales on the wings as an extra touch. Father had painted eyes on two squares of canvas and added them to the front rudders. They hung limp now, but during the night they would flap like flags. After they had admired our paint job, Miss Whitlaw produced a small bottle of wine. For the christening, she said, whatever it's to be named. Dragon wings, Father said. That's a funny name, Robin said. Ah, uh, well, it's a lucky name, Father shrugged. His dream was still something very special and very private, and not to be shared even with the Whitlaws. Robin wrapped both her hands around the neck of the bottle and tapped it lightly on the frame. None of us was very sure about how strong the frame really was. The bottle broke, and Robin ignored the wine stains on her dress to declare in a very solemn voice, I christen you dragon wings. But it was mid-September before we could even think of flying dragon wings. Page 277. The rains did not clear until that second week of September near the time when we had to pay our rent. The deliveries were light on the sixth day of the week, and after I finished my chores at the store, I was let off early. But when I got home and opened the side door to the barn, I found Black Dog there, rummaging through our bedding. He sat down on a stool when he saw me. How do you do, Moon Shadow? What are you doing here? Can't one cousin visit another cousin? It's a lonely country. Maybe I missed the sight of your monkey's face. He bent his elbow and scratched himself like a monkey for a moment. He had always tried to make jokes like that, but they were never very funny. I saw that time had not been very kind to him. 
Do you want some tea before you go? I asked. Black Dog smiled coldly. You have all of my father's charm and tact. Do you know that? What do you want? He waved a hand at an old overstuffed chair we had found in the mansion and brought into the barn. Come, sit and talk with a lonely man. His voice grew hard when I remained standing. I said, sit. I'll stand, if you don't mind. Page 278. Black Dog shrugged. He leaned forward and clasped his hands together, resting his elbows on his knees. We never did get to finish that talk we began a long time ago. About what? About those two lovers to whose memory I have consecrated myself. You mean the demon dung. Black Dog laughed and regarded me in a cold, shrewd way. I want you to tell me about the thing you find yourself married to. Your life, that is. I want you to tell me why you don't think your life is ugly. He waved a hand around. You live by yourself with your father whom you hardly see. You live in a place unfit even for animals. It is cold in the winter and an oven in the summer. Your clothes are patched. You are undernourished because all your money goes into this demon contraption that you are not even sure will work. And you don't think your life is ugly? What do clothes or food or a house mean? I shrugged. Suddenly I realized something. You're jealous, aren't you? You're jealous that we have something to believe in. Black Dog stopped scratching his leg and slipped his hand into his boot. He pulled out a knife. I'd like you to find the beauty in my cutting off your nose and ears. Page 279. He got up slowly. He was smiling to himself. Yes, I'd like you to try to tell people how beautiful you are with only a stub of a tongue. I grabbed the nearest thing to hand. It was one of Father's books. I threw it at Black Dog, but he ducked. He came toward me slowly, the knife gleaming in his hand. I turned and darted out the door. Black Dog was right behind me. I could hear his boots pounding the ground. I ran through the tall flowers in the garden and made it into the orchard. I wanted to take a shortcut through the orchard to the road leading down to the town, but then my foot caught on a root. I fell forward into the weeds and old leaves. I got up on my hands and knees and caught Black Dog's boot in my ribs. I toppled over onto my back. He drove a knee hard into my stomach. Or maybe I'll take a testicle or two. He let up on my stomach a bit so I could breathe. I suppose he wanted me to get enough air so I could beg, but I suddenly got sick of the whole cat and mouse game. Go on, I told him. Get it over with then. You won't be singing that tune the first time the knife breaks your precious skin. When I did not say anything, Black Dog smiled. Well, you're a plucky lad, though you're a fool. I'll let you off easily if you tell me where you keep your money. Page 280. No. He jabbed his knee into my stomach and pressed the knife point against my throat. Come on, come on, tell me where the money is. You just said yourself that money wasn't important. Dragon Wings is. We heard a branch snap. Black Dog did not look around. He kept the knife to my throat. I felt my throat muscles begin to tighten as if they were trying to crawl away from the point. Don't take another step, Black Dog warned. I can cut your son's throat before you can jump me. Don't harm him, Father said. I heard him walk around from behind us until he stood in front of Black Dog. How important is that demon contraption to you? Black Dog asked. It's very important. More important than your son's life? Don't tell him, Father, I said. No, Father said. I'll get the money for you. Father, don't. But I saw Father walk over to a nearby oak tree. An old, battered birdhouse swung from one of its branches. Father reached up. Even he had to stand on a tiptoe to get it. Page 281. He took it down and pulled off the rooftop. It was only tacked on lightly with very small nails. He took the money out, a thin roll of demon dollar bills, and tossed the birdhouse down. He put the bills into his big handkerchief and tied up the corners into a bundle. Then he tossed it over to Black Dog. Black Dog snatched it up like a hungry dog after a bone. He stuffed it into his pockets. I should slit your son's throat anyway. And you know I'd never rest till I got even with you. Yes, I respect you at least that much. Black Dog got up and ran off into the trees. I started to get up to chase him, but felt suddenly dizzy. I must have banged my head when I fell, and my chest where he had kicked me felt suddenly tight. I fell forward. Moonshadow, Father said. He bent over me. Go after him, I said. That bastard, that son of a bitch. He's still our cousin, despite what Uncle did, Father said sternly. He helped me back into the stable and brewed some tea. Father poured a cup for me in the teapot and gave it to me. I drank it. Outside, I could hear the rain. I'm sorry you had to tell him. Father patted my arm and managed a smile. 
It doesn't matter. I'm going down to report this to the sheriff now. Page 282. Do you think it might do any good? It might, Father Grindon shrugged, and it might not. It was getting near sunset now. I could see the red light within the barn. Our rent money had been in that roll, as well as the money we had planned to use for renting a wagon and a team of horses. What we were going to do for money, I didn't know. Well, the sheriff never did catch Black Dog, and the next day when the landlord came around for his rent, he got mad at Father when Father asked him for an extension. He gave us three days to come up with the money, or he'd claim everything inside the place. But we didn't know anybody in the town we could borrow money from. They all thought of Father as the crazy Chinaman. We knew beforehand that Miss Whitlaw did not have any money she could lend out, for Robin's college money was sacred and untouchable, even if we were inclined to ask. And Father was too proud to go back to the company. We had to go, but how? Dragon Wings was too big to be carried on our backs, and we had no money to hire a wagon. Page 283. We tried all the next day, but no one would rent us one on credit. Not to the crazy Chinaman. Even my employer in the store refused, saying it was too much money. It looked like we were stuck. We would be able to take away only what we could carry. We were going to lose our dragon wings. Father did not say anything when I put on my boots and hat and went down to the town through the rain to use the store's electric talker, or telephone as the demons called it. I wound the crank with a whirring sound, and when the operator came on, I gave her the number of the house where the Whitlaws worked. Why, hello, Moonshadow, Miss Whitlaw said. How are you? Fine. I'm afraid you won't be able to come down tomorrow. We're, we're moving. Oh, found a better place? Yes, that's it. Well, let us give you a hand. No, no, I couldn't think of it. Nonsense, there's always work to be done. Expect us there right after church. No, please, you mustn't come, I said desperately. There was a pause at the other end of the line. Is there something wrong? She finally asked, page 284. No, no, everything's just fine. Well then, why can't we come over? She demanded. We'll just be busy. So busy you don't need help? Miss Willa asked suspiciously. Yes, that's it, I said, and hung up before she could ask me anything else. The rain had stopped by the time I got back. I could not make out where Father was in the barn when I first got back. Then I made out a shadowy figure sitting near Dragon Wings. Father? He stirred in his corner. I heard a groping at the stove, and then he struck a match, and the light flared about his face as he bent over the kerosene lamp, intent on lighting it. He shook the match out and then trimmed the flame. Then, and only then, did he look up. He fumbled painfully for the right words. It's finished, he finally said. We still have a day to raise the money, I said grimly. You will not go to uncle, father said. He ran his hand lightly along the lower wing. He stood up suddenly and got his padded jacket from the nail on the wall. He put it on silently and gestured to me to accompany him. Outside, the night was a cool, crisp autumn evening. The rain had just washed everything, seeming to sharpen the plant's smells. Page 285. The color seemed brighter, and the beaded raindrops gleamed like jewels on the petals of the flowers and the leaves of the trees. It was clear for the moment, but I could see the fog beginning to move over San Francisco. I could not see how people could stand to live in the flatlands when they could live in the hills. There is something about the view from the hill that is exciting, a kind of godlike perspective in which men become only tiny creatures walking about their toy houses on a patch of land which seems to float on a vast ocean under an even bigger sky. Father started to trudge up the hill. I had to run to catch up with him. The road was muddy and our boots made wet, sucking noises. My jacket was not really thick enough to hold out the wind, and I pulled the collar tighter about my neck. It was a cold, sharp wind, but with a salt sea smell. Father glanced at me, but still he said nothing. The setting sun behind us cast long shadows, which raced up and up and ahead of us along the road. And then at the very top of the hill, we turned off, walking to the very edge of it and looking down on the barn below us. Father crossed his arms, slipping his hands into his armpits to keep them warm. So this is the way it ends, he said finally. We came so close, and yet we failed. Page 286. The fog had completely covered San Francisco now and was rolling over the bay toward Oakland. It was as if the world below us were slowly fading away like the dream it was, and only we existed now on a tiny island of reality here on this hilltop. Maybe this is the final test in this life, I suggested hopefully. Father thought for a bit and laughed. Yes, maybe it is. We can build another dragon wings. You have your designs now, and we know all the tricks of actually building an aeroplane. Father grunted and he smiled in his old way. Then he tilted back his head and began to sing. 
There is a little beauty in the opening of a flower. There is a little glory, though it only lasts an hour. There is a little sorrow in the final farewell kiss. There's only a little pain, though you'll never again see or miss. I have a little dream for the flying of a plane. I have a little scheme. I'll follow yet again. There is a little heaven just around the hill. I haven't seen it for a long time, but I know it's waiting still. Then he clapped his hand on my shoulder. How about a cup of tea to warm our old bones, he asked. Poor black dog. There was some beauty to light after all, even if it was only the beauty of hope. End of chapter 11. So, um, you are now going back to that worksheet that I went over before I read. And I already gave directions, so I'm not going to re-give directions. But just as a reminder, you're using those um, top parts as like a reference sheet just to remind you of what summarizing is, how you should summarize, things like that. And then you are write, writing your summary at the bottom of that worksheet. And your summary should be at least five sentences. Really, it should only be five sentences. No less, no more. Um, so try your best to get right around five sentences. Awesome. Um, I will be on and off my computer and phone all day. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, you can comment on Google Classroom, email me, call or text me. Um, and I will see you again tomorrow. Bye.